otherwise, here we go. There are three softwares I want to cover by the top. This one is called the Barbo. The next one is called Spectrum. And the one after that is called WSJT. This stands for Leak Signal K1JT. K1JT is the one who developed it. Now, what I, what I discovered I usually do. with Argo I got in, is it's I a DSP really program, I'm getting that now, where some of you guys who talked about all that neat stuff can, can tell me what all the algorithms are, like, what the DSP making, and the, you know, how many different algorithms you stick the signal through to make it come out like this. But, I have discovered by using Argo as a weak signal detection aid in my work on six meters, that it did a lot of other fun stuff. And it was really, really very good. This stuff was normally made for detecting very low frequency signals. And all it does is it takes the audio signal coming out of your transceiver and processes it, and processes it, and processes it, and processes it, comes out like this. Now I've got some WAV files in this computer that I'm gonna play for you. And these WAV files aren't gonna have any sound with them. So it's going to be a little bit boring, but as this thing goes along, I think we can tell you what's happening. At least make an attempt with some of the smarter guys here to tell me what's really going on. Uh, this is a recording, a waveform recording of Channel 3 in Great Falls, Montana. Channel 3 video. Now this Channel 3 video is 100 kW, you know, ERP of 100 kW. And it's right on a big hill just outside of Great Falls. If you know where Great Falls is, I know where Great Falls, Montana is. It's KRTV. KRTV? Who said that? Oh, okay, KRTV. Okay, it sounds good. I'm in Seattle. Okay? And I'm looking at this signal. Now, there's not enough signal there to really detect the video, but there is enough signal from tropospheric bending and from meteor scatter to get some fun looking stuff. And if you have your speaker on, of course, you hear all the stuff that's going on at the same time. So this is just fun stuff, that's all. Nothing more than that. And um, you can also see some other things going on here. So I'm gonna start this wave file right here. And you can see it scroll from right to left across the screen, very slowly. And about, oh, you see with the 1100, 1110 is, that's 10 cycles in audio difference between the two. Right above 1110, I think, is where you will see the uh, video signal coming in from Channel 3 in Great Falls. The one down below, that's something else I have yet to figure out. <laughs> okay, keep watching. There. That is a meteor burst. The Doppler. The speed with which the meteor is coming in is pretty high, so you can see that it's moved about 20, to, uh, 20, yeah, about 15 to 20 cycles above the carrier frequency. And here's another one, bingo, another one that comes through. When you listen to this stuff, you can actually hear the signal in the speaker come up at 1100 hertz, you know, beep, like that. And, uh, okay, in the background now, you can see some other stuff that's coming in, and that's the tropo signal. If you just look very carefully along that line, you can see a little enhancement of the signal as it comes through. It turns out that the best time to watch this stuff is about 6 o'clock in the morning. And it doesn't require much of an antenna. I happen to be using a pair of 6 element Yankees for 6 meters, not this frequency, which is about 66.250 megahertz. And so, so the gain is not perfect for, for this. I'll bet if you just stick up a dipole of 66.250, you'd get much better results than what I did off this 6 meter antenna. Okay, you can see all kinds of neat stuff going on there. I still think the main signal is down there at 1110. But all this other stuff with Doppler shift and everything else on it is coming in about 15 to 20 hertz higher. So that means that the Earth is turning, the meteors are coming in at a tangential angle to the Earth, and because they're going towards the transmitter, 
the frequency is higher and it's getting reflected back to me. Me? Fun stuff. You, you waste hours doing this kind of stuff. <laughs> it's really cool. <laughs> Anybody who's got one of the broadband receivers, you know, like an FT847 or any of the any of the newer stuff, can tune up and hear this kind of thing. Anybody can. Okay, let me uh, let me stop this and bring up another wave file that's even more interesting in my mind. Go set up, select the input. I'm going to open up a WAV file, and there they are right there. The one I just showed you is, is this one right here, channel 3. Uh, there's also one at Houston that I've got, and one at Idaho Falls. And here, here, that's all channel 3. This is each television station in the United States that transmits on, on one of three offsets. The video frequency will be either right on uh, 66.250 in case of channel 3, or 10 kilohertz higher, or 10 kilohertz lower. And you can identify stations that way by knowing what the, what the off set frequency is. So that's, that's one way to tell who, who you're looking at. But now we go down to channel two, which puts the, the, the resonant frequency antenna more closely than for, for my six meter antenna. I think the frequency is 55.250 for the zero offset for channel two. And I'm gonna be looking at Spokane, channel two in Spokane, but you're going to see all kind of fun and interesting stuff here. Come on, see if I can open this now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay, here's the big signal, which is what, only 185, 200 miles away in Spokane, something like that. Going right over the mountains, nice big carrier, big fat things sticking in there. But watch the signal down here, right around in here. And look at this program. It tells me what the relative signal level is. Watch that signal level go down. Okay? You can see in red there. Now I'm going to put it right on it. And that's a pretty good signal to noise ratio. When the noise is something like uh, 66 dB, dB. And then we get up here and we're talking about, oh gosh. 40 dB signal to noise ratio. Here's a meteor burst with lots of Doppler, but look at this thing coming down here. Now I happen to know what that is. Does anybody know what that is? No? Yes, jet aircraft. Yeah. Yeah. That's a Doppler shift from jet aircraft as it goes through a common area in the troposphere that looks at my signal, at, at, at both, at my antenna and at the antenna, the other one, sir. How do you know? How do you learn that that's associated with How do I know that it's a Doppler? No, that it's associated with either the meteor or the airplane. Oh, with meteors, meteors come into the atmosphere at a much higher speed because of the speed of the Earth. And uh, you can immediately tell. And they burn up only in the E layer. Uh, and upper, in the lower F layer and the E layer, and some get as low as the D layer, which is lowest around 30 miles, and then the E layer is up from one, uh, about, about 100 miles above the Earth. Anything above 100 miles is the F layer. So the relative time, the transit for the meteor going through those layers is much quicker than what this, this aircraft is. This aircraft is, is working in the common area in the troposphere that both my antenna and the antenna at the transmitter site is looking at. Now, I can't see the signal directly, but I'm getting a lot of trouble from it. And it's, it's at a frequency again where I'm starting to get the, the 12 dB off my 16 or 10 to start to look at pretty good gain, so you can see smaller signals being bounced off the aircraft. I'm sorry? Go ahead. Is that from the metal of the jet or from the vapor? Yes, from the metal of the jet. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's a good question, and it's an interesting thing, and, and it, all those questions just bend my mind. <laughs> and I sit here and look at this stuff and try to figure out what really is happening here. Yeah, yeah. 
And how, 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 I don't think there would be any other way, except by looking at the transponder, if I had an illegal transponder, to, to know if that aircraft was really there, you know, at that particular time. But it's an interesting question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, sir. Oh, yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah, many other ones coming through there. It's fantastic. Look at this. I wish I had a, a whiteboard here. I've got a big circle around the TV transmitter. And I've got a big circle around my own transmitter. Now, I can't see the TV transmitter directly, but in the troposphere, there is a, uh, a common volume where my antenna will look at the part of the troposphere and the TV antenna will look at the troposphere. As the aircraft flies through that common volume, the signal bounces off the aircraft and back down to my, um, my transceiver. Okay. And if that aircraft is going towards the, the transmitter, then you would expect a higher Doppler shift, just like the, the uh, railroad sounds, you know. And if it's going away, you should hear a lower Doppler shift, so you know what it is. Go ahead. No, it isn't. Hey, that hasn't got a thing to do with it. This is always there. You can go, the only thing that's different is, as I said, the meteor levels go lower in the afternoon and evening, and they hit a low low at about midnight. Then they start coming right back up again because of the diurnal shift in the, in the Earth around 6 a.m. Then you start getting a really high peak. That's why most meteor scatter schedules for random meteors is done early in the morning, around 6, 7, 8 o'clock. Yeah, well done. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Ah. Uh, you, I've never tried to... Would you repeat the question? Oh, I will repeat the question from now on. I'm sorry, yes. Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, he was wondering if this was a, a, a function, what we're looking at, was a function of something else, uh, some diurnal changes that happen in the atmosphere as, as you should go from day to night and back, back again. And it, the, question, the answer to the question is, yes, both. You do have a diurnal shift in the meteors, but it, it's not really atmospheric type problem. It, this, what you see here can happen any time day and night. You can turn that direction and see it. If I see the antenna, that was the other question, do I see a change? I don't know for sure. I don't know for sure. As you're swimming the antenna, you may create a little bit of Doppler shift because you're going to be looking at perhaps a little bit portion. Yeah, but I don't think we have the discernibility here, the, the resolution to see that kind of thing. But you do, for an aircraft that's flying, you know, 152 or 300 miles an hour, 350 miles an hour is what the average aircraft flies at altitude. So you see the Doppler shift that way. And yeah, look at, look at this one up on the top. Isn't that an interesting thing? Right here. Okay, the five minutes is over. Each one of these was done in five minutes. In amongst this, you can see Doppler shift, you know, everywhere, pings, all, kind of, all kinds of neat, neat stuff. Go ahead. Yeah, the, the question was, um, why do I have to use the Montana one? Why do I, why do I want to look at Seattle or some of the other kind of stuff? And the, uh, the answer is, um, if I use any of the Seattle stations, uh, the carrier is so strong that it just just overloads the receiver. If I go to someplace outside my own reception area, then I can see, you know, it, it comes down to a level where I can where I can look at the stuff. But this stuff will twist your brain around all kinds of, all kinds of different ways. Okay, now we're done with that one. Let's look at a different program here. Let's look at um, okay, Spectran. By the way, these are all these programs are all free and available on the internet. Okay. Okay. Now so I have. You'll notice. I don't know if you noticed, but but Spectran was made by the same people who made Argo. Argo was the first, and sometimes still the best program okay, so for DSP for looking at weak signal stuff. In my mind, Spectran has. Um, the same thing plus. Okay, I'm going to download a WAV file. Okay. 
Let's go up here to, uh, oh, let's go to Miles City, Houston. Okay, now you see up here this program, which is a lot better. Up some play, play buttons I can, uh, I can go to. <laughs> All right. See the signal come up here? Let me see if I can. Yeah, you see, see another Doppler ship right over here? Unfortunately, you can't hear it. I wish there was... Okay, every once in a while, a blue wizard will come by and it will knock you right off your chair. It will be very, very loud and uh, it, it will be a great surprise. So, I just want to show you this stuff because it's fun. You can look at it. You can look at it. There was a big one. You, obviously, you can hear the latency between the meteor burst and when it appears on the video, so there's a lot of processing that this poor little laptop can't handle. You know, so there's going to be some latency involved in there. Okay, let me just go one more. Let me set up on here. Let's look at channel 2 east again. And start it. And let's turn on the band pass filter. You can hear it gets, the band pass filter gets rid of a lot of the noise. So it's, it's easier to listen into. And again, here are all those tremendous Doppler shifts with the, with the aircraft coming by. All kinds of them. This is a little later in the afternoon, so the aircraft traffic goes a little bit more. I sit there and watch this stuff, I try to figure out which way the airplane is going. You know, is it going towards me, going away from me? Is it coming in from the left of the transmitter, from the right of the transmitter, exactly towards me? What's it doing? Is it flying in a circle? Some of them will. They get out there and turn a corner because they have some place above lookout pass, you know, a VOR site that they use to, to change their vector with. So, it's, it's really interesting kind of stuff to, to watch. I don't think it would take much to add that into the, into the, the whole thing, but it was never made for that kind of thing. You know? It was made to look at weak signals. Here's what I do. For this program and for Argo, I use it to detect 
the European television stations over the North Pole at six meters. That way I have a precursor to signals from Europe coming in on six meters. And a lot of the de etchers on six meters do that kind of thing. So they have a heads up, hey, we might have an opening for Europe on six meters. Now these transmitters, these transmitters in Europe have 500,000 watts ERP, so they're really good things to look for. And you can see them. You can see the Doppler shift just from the F2 coming in and out. And you can hear them fading. You can also hear the auroral buzz on the signals as they come over the North Pole at times. So it's really interesting to, to give a precursor. Go ahead, though. Uh, usually, uh, you know, you, you've got to go right out of it. You, you can get as high as 25 or 30 degrees offset from a direct path. Normally for Europe, you're going to be pointing at 30 degrees from the sea out of And you, you can tell that on H, HF2. It's about 30 to 40 degrees. If you want to get into uh, Africa, you'd be down around 40, 45. If you want to go lower than that, you know. It gets around that around that region, but because the propagation um, vary, various vary, variations, you can also get um, signals that are offset very far, as, as much as 45 degrees from where, where you expect. So you got you got to listen for that kind of stuff if you're going to going to really go for it. Yeah. Oh. It's a good question. Look at this. The resolution for DSP is 0.34 hertz. Not 30 hertz, 0.34 hertz. But that's not what I'm listening to. I'm listening to about... Let me show you what I'm using though, however. Set up. Uh, show. I want to say show filter. Gee, I know a lot about this program. Do you think it's under filters? Ah. Okay. There. There's the bandwidth. So it's at 200 hertz. This, however, is, is, is going like this, up to a peak, down, and down like that. So right at the peak, it's around four or five hertz. If you use the CW filter, but I don't think you hear anything if I put the CW peak filter in. Can't hear much difference. You see, I changed by clicking on it. Now let me go in the other direction. There. It's a neat program. It's fun. Okay, let me show you the last program I wanted to show you then. That'll be the end of what I've got here, folks. Huh? Uh, okay, thank you. This, this program, WSJT6, by K1JT, weak signal JT, not W1JT, but K1JT. This guy is smart. He's got more brains in his little finger than I will ever have. And he, he runs the signals through all kinds of filters in order to get what he wants out of it. Now in this setup too, I can, um, oh yeah. Let's see. Uh, come on. Here we go. It's not telling me what I can do. Okay. We've done all that. There's a place to pull. Yeah. 
freak. Well, there's a place to pull that, pull it out, and uh, pull the wave file inside. Do you know where it is? All right, Duh. Yeah. Uh, open connection directory. I'll just do it open and see. So it's 
got a predisposition algorithm that's looking for any signal in a particular window that fits that algorithm. And if I hear anything in there, it's going to say, yeah, that's got it. That's got to be it. Because I know he's transmitting exactly at this time. This is all synchronized with, uh, with that clock stuff off the internet, you know, where you get your clock set exactly right. So this and yours. So how far can ham radio operators go before they're really keen on making a contact? Big controversy. The old timers say, oh, you guys can't do that. In our day, we have to have to have them in the speaker, or hear them in the speaker. If you can't hear them in the speaker, you know, you're not making a contact. Uh, guys, you know, around uh, 20, 25 say, oh, honey, this thing works great. Was it controversy because you arranged <coughs> contacts in advance? Yeah, 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 yeah. Because you arranged the contact in advance. Yes. <coughs> Anyhow, so that all has to be fought out back at AWRL headquarters someplace. And we got another 15 years before it's all fixed up, you know. <laughs> Okay, that's all I got, gentlemen. Thank you so much. Thank you.